Science faction is for adults only, and children old enough to seduce their teacher. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 252. Science Faction, I call BS. This is after last week where you stole a victory from me. We're actually one point one. I thought you lost. Didn't we decide? Oh, you tied and then you lost? But then also that Bill had a better point than you, so then he won by two. No, the fact I, that you bring this the up. Fa- the, fact, the fact that you decided to take away from my profession of parapsychology I hate, and use that to take... I hate to bring this up, Damien, but you claiming a victory you didn't get is... Actually, a minus point in this game, <laughs> so you're starting at negative one. <laughs> what isn't a minus point? All, all I know is last time I was here, I beat Damien. Yes, oh, yeah, that would be literally every time so. we've ever played well, this game. Well, I don't, loses, I, so. I don't acknowledge your minus okay, point. So, right. I don't even acknowledge no, it. I, I do, maybe, though. Yeah, maybe not acknowledging things. <laughs> Ian, stop acknowledging it. Maybe not acknowledging your problems is the reason you've lost this game every time. <laughs> all right, I Call BS is the game where I read four science news articles, and my panelists compete to see which ones are real and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. So are you guys ready to play? Every year I, for my birthday, I wish for an impartial judge, and I call BS, like to free me from this. You this must have prison. gotten it five years ago. It's the most Sisyphus- impartial you've ever gotten, Damien. Most Sisyphusian task. Ian, are you ready? I am. All right, let's go. I call BS. I call. 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 Ring, ring. I call BS. All right, article number one. Despite all the doom and gloom coverage, the numbers indicate that every successive year, human life expectancy increases both in the U.S. and internationally. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. Uh, With the advent of new technology, there are now more ways for old people to kill and harm themselves and others than ever before. That's true. Most of the time, and others includes just bothering people online. All right, and Ian. I'm going to go bad science just because I want to blame the anti-vaxxers for this. Okay. It would be a pretty big effect if it was like actually affecting mortality rates. All right. Article number two. Last week, archaeologists found the buried remains of a pre-1200s macaw breeding compound in the American Southwest over a thousand miles from the bird's native homeland. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science and the first evidence of the first Margaritaville in the North America. Oh, they were breeding the mar- macaws for Margaritaville. It's just a place for chilling and hanging out, for having yeah. a drink and chillaxing, bro. And Ian. I'm also going to go science. Um, I think this is because of the pirates. A pre-1200s pirates, huh? Well, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't, but all right. <laughs> You're uh, the archaeologist. And <laughs> article number three, a new study shows that a standard Wi-Fi router can be used to detect bombs, weapons, and chemicals inside of bags. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, and it can also tell if you say the N-word regularly, how, what your frequency is. I mean, is. you could just have a cell phone doing that. That's pretty easy voice that's, recognition. That's what it reads. Yeah, all right. And Ian. I'm going to go science. All right. And lastly, article number four. New research indicates that most attempts to tell jokes by science teachers actually lead to less effective classroom learning by students. Damien, is this science or bad science? Judging by the amount of comments we have on our iTunes page after five years of hilarious podcasting and parapsychology uh-huh. uh, I would have to say bad science, but I'm not going to do that. Oh, okay. I'm going to say um, we are the anomaly. I'm going to say it's science. I and that our jokes are actually deeply affecting people. They are just too busy in their Matt Damon goodwill hunting like state doing math on a wall to okay. leave an iTunes comment. So I I'm mean, gonna say science. Maybe they're all discouraged by your inability to win any of a single game of I call BS. I don't know, maybe that's it. Fake news. Okay, and Ian. I'm gonna call bad science. I feel jokes help all learning. Let's go back and see how you guys did following at home and see how you did. Article number one, despite all the doom and gloom coverage, the numbers indicate that each successive year, human life expectancy increases both in the U.S. and internationally. Both of you guys thought this was bad science, and this one is bad science. So this is interesting. And keep in mind, when they do these studies, they're a few years behind because it takes a while to calculate the data from every country. So I think this is looking at like 2015, 2016, around that time. So... This was actually showing a decreased life expectancy over that year. From one of the, we're kind of seeing a turnaround and a decrease. Now, 
Worldwide, this was attributed to that being a particularly bad flu year. As we've talked about before, the flu kills a lot of people. We don't really think about it here, but it kills a lot, especially in the third world countries. That was a particularly bad flu year, and it killed a lot of extra people. Now, these are all deaths on kind of the tail ends of the human spectrum, right? The very young and the very old are the ones who usually die from flu deaths. The one interesting little snippet of this is in the United States, we also saw an increase in death or a decrease in life expectancy, but it was from people in their 20s and 30s because we're in the middle of a fucking heroin epidemic and our people are dying so much and so fast that it is skewing our demographic death data. That's crazy. So many people are dying from heroin and drug overdoses. And by the way, I'm not just saying this, attributing it randomly. The increase of the people in their 20s and 30s was attributed directly to drug overdoses. So many people are dying in their 20s and 30s that it's actually skewing the demographic data and changing the life expectancy for your average American. That's insane. Do you think overall, like uh, in, in America's more rural states, there's actually a negative population shift because of it with baby boomers dying and a lot of 20 year olds dosing themselves, getting hot fixes? I mean, all I'm going to say is this. It's, it's very interesting that we are in the only time span. This is really new. This is a new thing to see life expectancy literally do a U-turn. We've seen a steady graph throughout our grandparents' generation, our generation, as we figured out antibiotics, as we figured out better living conditions, as we figured out more health and fitness things, better long-term medical care. All we saw was just rise, 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 rise. We're seeing a downturn. It's like the first time in like a century that we have seen this in the Western world in the United States. Aside from little blips and things like World War II, we're seeing a downturn, and it's because of heroin. Well, I would argue it's not just because of heroin. It's opioids in general, yes. like fentanyl. Yes, yes, yes. But I mean, a lot of times that leads to heroin addiction, right? It's because well, they, can't, they can't afford it anymore. I say heroin is cheaper yeah. than Vicodin. What yeah. do you guys think the resolution to this is? Do you think at some point there's going to be a, a class action lawsuit? What do you or? do? How do you? I mean, listen, we say it's more addictive than heroin for a reason, right? So this is like one of the most addictive drugs that you can use, and it ruins people's lives. And one of the problems is the recidivism rate is so high. It's something like 95%. So that even those that quit, whether it's one year out or 10 years out, usually go back. That's really hard to fight. You're fighting an enemy that's just better than you. Like, what are you going to do? The only thing that I see really solving this is some of the immune therapies we've discussed on the show before, where you actually give somebody what is essentially a vaccine, their body, their immune system learns to fight the uh, receptors for opiates. And therefore, every time somebody takes opiates, their immune system destroys the opiates before they can actually act neurologically on that person. To me, the only way you can stop this is by giving somebody a shot that basically keeps them from being able to get high. Well, I, I know that the... Um... I know that the prescription practices have changed a lot. So before yeah. you used to be able to go to a doctor, you had yeah. a broken bone or something, they'd give you 30 days yeah. worth of Vicodin. Now it's you know seven days or even three days. But which... it's so pervasive through you know society. It used to be that we had to create heroin users because they weren't just everywhere. But now there's so much, they're everywhere, that maybe we could stop your average person from getting a prescription and getting addicted, but you're not going to ex- stop your average kid from getting exposed to it growing up because it's so pervasive. It's like more pervasive than marijuana was when we were kids. I just think it's so pervasive that even if you stop prescriptions tomorrow because it's it's such a big part of our society and so many people use it that kids would still get exposed to it and it would still be a problem. But if you if you stop the flow, I mean a lot of these kids aren't starting with heroin. They're not they're not their first exposure to opiates isn't isn't necessarily heroin. I have to imagine I'm not a kid I mean, growing up anymore. But it's so, it kind of can be now because it's such a big part of everybody's life. People got addicted from doctors and stuff, but now that they've all switched to heroin, it's becoming very common. Well, you yeah, know what the solution you... is for us three to twenty one Jump Street this problem. Oh, I like it in the schools. Article number two. Last week, archaeologists found the buried remains of a pre-1200s macaw breeding compound in the American Southwest, thousands of miles from the bird's native homeland. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is bad science. They did determine one of those existed, but they did it very interestingly. They have not found it. What they did find is they found scattered macaw remains across the American Southwest. We've discussed this before. It's very interesting because these animals come from essentially South America. So how do you get these up there? Well, you have this very advanced Pueblo culture that lived in the American Southwest who were responsible for things like Chaco Canyon, and they worshipped or the had chocolate some... chocolate canyon? Yes, Damien, the <laughs> chocolate canyon. Is that another scat joke? <laughs> that was last week, Ian. Yeah. So they had some kind of reverence for this bird because they brought them there. 
But when looking at the bird remains, they looked at like 18 different remains. I think they were able to get DNA out of 14 of them. They found that all of them had this very narrow range haplotype, meaning they all came from this one lineage of macaws from this very specific area, meaning that you didn't necessarily have people from the Pueblo going down to South America, grabbing a bird and coming back. You had to have a breeding program that was using only a narrow lineage of birds going on in the Southwest at some point somewhere. We have not found that place. We don't know where it is. We just know that theoretically, based on the distribution of those macaw bones, it should be in the American Southwest, possibly Northern Mexico. But the genetics tell us there has to be this breeding program. Otherwise, we'd see a wider variety of haplotypes. And it has to have been in this general area. And it has to have been important enough to these Pueblo people to put so much resources into not only getting the original breeding birds, but then keeping them alive, taking care of them, running this puppy mill for macaws for so long. For literally hundreds and hundreds of years, they did this. So clearly there was something important about these birds to this culture, even though these birds are not native to anywhere near where they lived. Well, they obviously recognize the importance of having a macaw if you're going to be a pirate. Yes, that must have been it. That was the gold that adventurers were seeking in the new world. I just think it was gold. It's like macaw owners today. Like, I just feel like it must have been that the the natives of the Pueblo people just had no personality and wanted to compensate. So they're like, I'll get a big ass bird and hang out on the boardwalk. I'd like to torture a bird. Like, yeah. I, even though this bird would be way happier with its own kind and isn't intelligent enough to be depressed, I yeah. think it should live with me. Absolutely. Article number three. A new study shows that a standard Wi-Fi router can be used to detect bombs, weapons, and chemicals inside of bags. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science. Very, very neat, because you think about all these devices that you go through when you're at the airport or you're walking into a courthouse or something like that. They're actually using a regular Wi-Fi router, like a, a Linksys thing that you just pulled off the Best Buy shelf. You're literally setting it up and using a Wi-Fi router to look at bags and look through them. So in the same way it works with a regular metal detector or radar or anything, it passes radio waves through it. It gets the bounce back and it can tell not only if you have a weapon, you can tell if you have somebody with a gun or a knife based on the shape of those bounce backs. You can also tell the density of liquids. You can tell if somebody is bringing an explosive liquid versus water versus anything else. That's really neat. And you're literally doing it with something right off the shelf. As long as you've got two, one of the ones that have two or three different antennas, you can use a standard Wi-Fi router and the proper programming to basically turn it into a device that sees things. My question is whether or not they can do it well enough to do like those background scatters that people were getting scared out at the airport where you could like see somebody see underneath somebody's clothes. Yeah, I mean, essentially, if that was the case, then Bobby could see if anybody who came on the show was armed. Also, right. he could see if I'm packing heat. Yeah. Under, under the hood, if you know what I'm saying. So very interesting stuff because you can set these up anywhere. They're way cheaper. You don't have to worry about all these expensive machines that you have to walk through and that kind of stuff. Now, you probably wouldn't want it as your last line of defense at a place like the airport, but maybe when you're walking into a business or uh, somebody wants to scan to make sure that the guy coming into the bar doesn't have a gun on him, like that kind of stuff, you can kind of set these up as your own local network. Maybe even coming into your house. Hey. I don't want anyone bringing those giant crocodile Dundee knives in my house anymore. Make them smaller, more concealable from yeah. the Wi-Fi. Also, that Wi-Fi would never be the last line of defense at an airport. TSA. American TSA yeah. is the last line of defense at the I airport. I thought you were going to say because airport Wi-Fi just sucks. It does. I mean, that's. Uh, let's talk about airline food, too, while we're at it. All right, and lastly, article number four. New research indicates that most attempts to tell jokes by science teachers actually lead to less effective classroom learning by students. Damien thinks this is true. Ian thinks this is false. And this one is bad science. Congratulations, Ian! I didn't even need that minus one. You didn't need the minus one. You didn't need the tie break. You just won legitimately one point over Damien. I thought I said bad science in last one, but oh well. No, the game you didn't. Is a you, rig- did. you did not. You know, okay, it's a, but it's oh well. It's a rigged game. Maybe, the, Doesn't reason, matter. maybe was... the reason you think you win is you just reimagine yourself giving the right answers in every situation. I, I'm not going to get mad at the carny. This was a game I was designed mm-hmm. to lose. I, I just, okay, you've, you've emasculated me in front of my girlfriend. Thank you very much. I don't get the bear. They found that it helps even when the jokes are bad because they were worried, like, what if the teacher is really bad at telling jokes? Yeah, that's the most science teachers. What if they're really bad at it? Turns out the kids kind of forgive the bad, but the good things stand out. And so the one exception is when jokes were considered offensive. And when they were quote unquote offensive, then the students were less likely to pay attention to what the, stu- the teacher was saying. But as long as they were telling jokes that were not literally putting them off by being offensive, they always helped. And so this is something interesting. It's kind of the basis of this show. You know, we found over and over again that rote memorization is a poor way to get somebody excited or to learn something. And however, dick jokes, however. Dick jokes, dick jokes are a great way. You get somebody super interested, 
both in what you're saying and the content of what you're saying, but also like the funniness of it, just the, the casual conversation of it, and incorporating it into a more lighthearted fashion, throwing some jokes in there, getting them interested, breaking the ice. All of that's important, but it's not just important to kind of get them in a learning mode. It helps you remember things because your brain doesn't work in some kind of way like an Excel spreadsheet where it just records, okay, pi is 3.14159, blah, 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 blah. In fact, what it does is if your instructor came in and makes a joke about eating pie or something like that, your brain stores those two memories together. So you think of that joke when you think of it and you remember, oh yeah, it's 3.14159 and you can remember it much, much better. Getting those kind of weird cues are the difference between us and a computer. And the reason that we can store things better and we remember things better when something extraordinary happens or something interesting happens, it's the reason that you remember a car accident. You can remember every detail of what happened right at or after that car accident. Because it was but you funny. Don't, yeah, right. Because it was a moment that was exceptional in some way. It had something different going on. It had something novel. As opposed to if I said, hey, tell me about minute four of your commute to work on Thursday of last week. And you'd be like, I don't know. It's the same thing I always... I was probably listening to the radio. I have no fucking clue, right? I was stuck at that fucking red light. Yeah, you'd have no idea. But if I said, if minute four happened to be when you got into a car accident, you'd sure as fuck remember that. That would be something you would store in your memory. It's oh, the I same shit thing. my pants at minute four. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Call a scatologist. But, uh, up, doo -doo, blah, blah. but if you have something that helps you remember and that can be something novel and especially good for humor and jokes or and this is something else we've talked about something very interesting if you tell somebody a very interesting fact that is connected to something they're learning they're much more likely to remember all of that stuff than if you all of a sudden just try and get them to remember a random thing so this is really important for learning it's something i think we do a poor job of in our educational system and we can do much better for those of you science teachers out there Play them some science facts in your high school class. You know what? Fuck it. You got tenure. They're not firing you. <laughs> this teacher's fucking awesome. Yeah, this teacher is sweet as balls. He's ignoring the warning at the beginning of every episode and playing it for us anyway. Anyway, congratulations, Ian, for just stomping Damien. Brutal, brutal victory. Uh, literally 100% lose ratio still going on for Damien. It's not, not true did you just all, lose? Did you just lose right now, Damien? Ian, Damien, I, did you just I lose right now? before? No. Did you? You liar. Liar. <laughs> did you just lose right now, David? Yes, we're oh, going to the archives. Oh, all right. and, and yes, I can just lose right now. Uh, Stop uh, being so... uh -huh. That is a logical fallacy, and uh, one that I don't remember the specific one at the moment. Uh, I feel like Damien's at the end of Shutter Island, and he's just figuring out that he's in the mental hospital. All right, uh, spoiler alert. I haven't won an Oscar yet. All right. Thank you, Ian, for coming back for 252. And thank you, audience, for coming back, where we learned why life expectancy is decreasing across the world. How scientists found a pre-1200s macaw breeding compound in the Southwest without actually finding it. How you can use a regular old Wi-Fi router to scan people for weapons. And how humor helps science teachers teach. Thank you so much for joining us and come on back next week for Science Faction 253. Take your seats. Take your seats. Good morning, class. We're going to start off science class today with a joke. What does the periodic table of elements have in common with my wife? They both fucked my best friend. You've been listening to Science Fiction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs>